As you mentioned, I'll talk about subclinical ketosis and then AMS carriers. So my name is Brandon Andrews. So as we look back at what North American or previous North American studies have reported over the years, uh, while we continually improve our management and feed, nutri or feed nutritional practices, we see little to no changes in our subclinical ketosis prevalence from a mean and range standpoint. However, when we look at one of the more recent studies on that list that was actually conducted here at the University as well, they observed that farms utilizing AMS systems, automated milking systems using robots, had 1.45 times greater odds of having higher subclinical ketosis or ketosis levels than compared to those conventionally milked herds on their study. So why might these farms have higher levels of subclinical ketosis or be predisposed to this higher level? It's thought that it might be related to their feeding management practice change that we observe in, um, between farms. For automated milking systems are not only reliant on feed at the food bunk, but also require supplementation at the AMS unit itself. A previously uh, study done in Dr. DeVries' lab by King observed that cows diagnosed with subclinical ketosis actually uh, produced more milk per unit of AMS supplement supplemented to them in the first seven days of milk compared to their healthy counterparts. This may be a major contributor to what was seen in the previous study since conventionally most systems usually feed a TMR or totally mixed ration and they don't need additional supplementation elsewhere, whereas AMS is mentioned previously relied not only on the energy of the TMR at the feed bunk, but also typically a higher or nutri higher nutrient dense supplementation at that TMR or at the uh, AMS unit itself. This can be a difficult situation, as Trevor mentioned this morning, that these cows may not be, or at the beginning of lactation, they're being either trained or reminded on how to access these uh, AMS units itself, let alone the concentrate being supplemented there. So this could be learned, or this could prove to be a steep learning curve for some of those cows and lead to inadequate consumption of uh, primary intake and, and ultimately energy. So with this, we have three research questions that I would like to address with you guys today. First being, what is the current prevalence of subclinical on these AMS herds across Canada? Second being, what factors may be associated with these farms experiencing these high levels of uh, subclinical and lastly, what can we supplement to help improve the metabolic status of these cows on these farms? So the first, or for the answer to the first question, um, we enrolled 184 AMS farms across Canada, uh, where we actually sampled, or milk sampled, 38,175 cows, uh, where we looked into the milk DHD levels um, with the help of Laxamet. Um, and we used a cut point of 0.151 millimolar to help us to diagnose subclinical ketosis. And in doing so, we observed uh, on a herd average, herd average subclinical ketosis prevalence for all cows about 22% or 21.9%. When we break that down by parity, we see our primary parish cows about 12.3%, while multi parish cows are 26.7 or 27%. So part of this study is also trying to help answer that second question by looking at management as well as environmental factors that may be related to these farms that are experiencing the higher levels of subclinical ketosis. And in doing so, uh, we observed that the length of time of light around the AMS was actually on was uh, associated with farms that experienced higher levels of subclinical ketosis prevalence in the primary parish cows. And so every, for every one hour of light increased around the AMS, we saw about a half a percentage point uh, reduction in overall subclinical ketosis prevalence. Also for primary parish cows, we observed that farms that had inter that targeted higher incre or increased their targeted TMR refusals were associated with a lesser or a reduction in their overall subclinical ketosis prevalence. So when we compare this 0% or slick bunk feeding management compared to the greater than 5% targeted TMR refusals, we see about a 10% reduction associated with those uh, farm differences um, in TMR or in the uh, prevalence of subclinical ketosis. Similarly, for multi parish cows, um, as we increased that target TMR refusal to those farms that targeted higher amounts of refusal, they were also associated with lower prevalence of subclinical ketosis. So again, comparing that 0% or slick bunk feeding management to that greater than 5% target refusal, we see that those herds um, differ by about 10 percentage points again. Lastly, while the study was not designed to test for causation, we did also observe an association between the flooring type around the AMS with the prevalence of subclinical ketosis in multi parish cows. So, as mentioned, we couldn't test necessarily causation, but um, we did see that our floors or the farms that had rubber around their flooring or, or rubber floors around the AMS were associated with five and a half percentage points less subclinical ketosis than those that just had concrete around their AMS uh, unit. So, how can we nutritionally address subclinical ketosis on AMS farms? 
the most important one, which was briefly mentioned this morning, is precision feeding. Um, this would look like uh, feeding higher nutrient dense uh, feedstuffs early in lactation when these cows are experiencing the higher nutrient or the higher negative energy balance. This could look like feeding either a fresh cow pellet or feeding more than one concentrate to the AMS, such as an energy and a protein supplement, and balancing not only for milk production, but also stage of lactation, parity, uh, body weight, and body condition score as well. Consider all those differences. And that fresh cow pellet, this gives us the opportunity to not only supplement alternative um, energy sources, but individual feed ingredients um, specifically too. Um, one done, is, as uh, Dr. Grease mentioned this morning, um, Moore studied molasses supplementation where she added 1.4 kilograms of molasses to the, um, at the AMS and observed an overall reduction in DHD concentration as well as fewer positive supplementosis tests in the first 21 days of milk. While molasses comes with its own challenges and may need some more additional equipment, we looked into an alternative in a low inclusion uh, dry glycerol product. And in doing so, we conducted a two by two factorial study design where we supplemented 250 grams of this dry glycerol product in either the TMR of the dry cow or the PMR of the lactating cow since these cows are milk to AMS. Um, we followed 60 multiferrous Holstein dairy cows with an average period of 2.5 at the lower dairy farm for this study. And in doing so, we observed that cows that received glycerol supplementation during that prepartum actually had increased dry matter intake both in the prepartum as well as the postpartum period. This would be comparing the uh, blue and yellow lines to that green and purple line um, by about 10% prepartum and about 5.5% postpartum in that increase in dry matter intake. However, when those cows were supplemented with glycerol postpartum, they actually experienced, experienced a reduction in their PMR and total dry matter intake postpartum. Um, when we look at our NEPA concentrations, we saw both a prepartum as well as a postpartum effect where glycerol supplementation reduced the overall NEPA concentration in the first seven days of milk. However, we did not see a interaction here, um, but we can see an additive effect being demonstrated here for those cows that received glycerol in a bulk stream of here, so that yellow bar, were numerically our lowest group, while those that never received any glycerol supplementation or that green bar were numerically our highest group um, in the NEPA, concentra NEPA concentration. While well, 50% of our cows in our study experienced a high NEPA test above our cut point of 0 0.7 millimoles per liter in the first seven days of milk, those that were supplemented prepartum with glycerol were actually 2.6 times less likely to experience this high NEPA test. While well, also looking at blood measures, we looked at our BHP concentration during the first 14 days of milk, and those cows that were supplemented with glycerol prepartum again had a reduction in their overall BHP concentration. However, when we look at blood glucose, we have not seen any differences, uh, treatment differences affecting those um, levels in the first 14 days of milk. And about 20% of our cows in our study experienced a blood glucose level between that 2.2 or below that 2.2 millimolar per liter cutoff point in the first 14 days of milk. But the cows that received glycerol postpartum were 5.9 times less likely to experience this low glucose test. So not only did we look at uh, blood measures, we also looked at fatty acid distribution of the milk, in the milk where we observed that cows that did not receive glycerol or that were on control during the lactation period had higher preformed fatty acid yields uh, in their milk in the first week and three weeks in lactation. Um, typically, preformed fatty acids are originating from the body reserves, um, which we need to note in this um, metric. However, we did not see any differences within our mixed or de novo fatty acid yields. So this distribution within our fatty acids would typically um, hint or would suggest that our cows that received glycerol have improved metabolic status during this time. And lastly, we, have, or we saw that uh, our cows that received glycerol during both treatment periods, again, that yellow bar, um, which would be glycerol glycerol treatment, lost the least percent of their body weight during the first 20, or during the 21 prepartum and 21 days postpartum. So this, plus our previously mentioned data, would suggest that those cows receiving glycerol during both periods are mobilizing the least amount of body reserves during the transition period. So with this, our research team, as mentioned, is continuing forward and looking at other stuff, but uh, one of our, our current students, uh, Clay McWilliams, is um, continually looking at the glycerol supplementation of the same product um, at a similar rate of 250 grams per day. However, they're only gonna be supplementing it in the first 21 days of milk rather than pre part period. And they'll be uh, including it in the AMS concentrate rather than um, in the PMR bunk itself, or PMR at the feed bunk itself. Uh, they'll be, they're currently enrolling uh, 400 cows on four, separate, four uh, commercial dairy farms. 
where they're measuring milk production as well as blood metabolic measures, such as the blood DH readings, blood glucose that I mentioned before. So you have to stay tuned to see in the near future what the outcomes of that study will be. Um, so just as a summary of kind of what we kind of covered today quickly, um, over the past six years, we've seen little to no improvements or changes in the uh, sub-glucose prevalence on these farms in North America. Um, while, as, as again, as Brett mentioned previously by Dr. DeVries, um, we continue to see in increased adoption of AMS um, across North America as well as you know, in Europe. We need to take cognizance that these AMS farms may be predisposed to higher levels of subsequent ketosis. We need to continue to improve our feed management as well as other practices and looking at our environmental factors that may increase this risk on these farms. Uh, the current subsequent ketosis prevalence on farm was about 22% for, for all cows. And when we look at multifarious cows in particular, it was about 26.7%, which is in line with what those previously mentioned studies have showed. Again, kind of going hammering down on the fact that uh, subsequent ketosis prevalence hasn't necessarily improved while we're continually improving those other measures. And lastly, while there are other options when it comes to supplementation, we, we definitely saw some improvement and some benefits to supplementing pre and postpartum with that glycerol supplementation um, from a metabolic state uh, standpoint for transition cows. And with that, I'd like to uh, take a moment to say a big thank you to the Dairy Farm and Long Carrier for supporting me through the, their doctoral scholarship program, as well as the rest of these groups that helped us in the studies that I had mentioned today. Thank you. Pressions 